Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the wasp in my visor. It's Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Now then, Dave, how's it? I'm all right, thank you. And you yourself? Very, very excellent. Very yeah, excellent. Yeah, you're looking very studious today with your glasses on, Mr. Plato. Do I not? Do I normally have them on? Don't I? Well, no, you I sometimes see. Well, you, 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 you. So I just they, they're particularly noticeable today. I think you I know, just, and, well, and I, I, I wonder whether it will set a, a trend for today's guest, who also may follow suit in, in the studious looks. I've just spotted him around the corner, and I maybe <laughs> slip some on just to, <laughs> just to lift his IQ. But obviously, we don't want to hear from him just yet. No, 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 no. Anyway, we don't. our guest today. Well, do you know what? Since I was a wee lad, and since he was a wee lad. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been friends since the early 80s. Mm. Now, he's most definitely a man that we can definitely describe as one of motor racing's royalty. Mm-hmm. From Formula One to Le Mans and everything in between. It is, of course, my old pal, Mr. Johnny Herbert. You are very right. We go back a very, very, very long way. Well, this is this this was going to be my opening gambit, Johnny. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on. I know that your paths have crossed many, many times, but exactly when they first crossed is something that I'm unsure about. So please fill me in. Well, do you know what? There's so many lovely stories. You know, we we st- we started off in karting. I mean, you you a bit before me, but I started yeah. in 1980. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was the national championship called the Super One Series, which we were charged up and down the country. My, my mum and dad became fr- fr- friends with Bob, Bob and Jane, uh, uh, jo- jo- Johnny's parents and his si- mm-hmm. sister, Sarah. And we were kind of just mates, weren't we? We were yeah. like family ca- mates. Jo- Johnny was always, you know, a, a, like a, an age bracket above me mm-hmm. because he's, you know, three years older. <laughs> <laughs> and it just goes back. I mean, there's so many fantastic stories, isn't there? I mean, Wombwell, do you remember all the scrapping which used to go on up the pubs on the Saturday night? Of the Saturday, yes, exactly. I remember, do you I remember, remember one that? particular one at, Woom, yeah, the Wombwell one at the pub at the top. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And me standing on a table after we'd had a couple <laughs> but, of locals having a chat with uh, uh, Lee Cramner's sister. I do remember one of well, the girls yes. that was up yeah, there. Yeah, Julie. Yes. Julie, yeah. that's it, Julie, yes. Yeah, I remember yeah. that, a little sort of um, scrap <laughs> happened happened in the pub. Just to fit, fill you in, Johnny, yeah. we weren't drinking at this age because we were no. young, but obviously mm. on a Saturday night, you know, karting, I mean, it's still probably like, like it is today, but, you know, there was like a big campsite. We'd all be camping in our, you know... Our, our Caravans. <laughs> Caravans and <laughs> caravans. <laughs> and that, Things have changed, so Jason. Things have changed. Yeah. Oh, haven't they? Just. And do you know what? A few of us would just kick around and walk up into town. Mm. And this was in the middle of darkest Yorkshire. South Yorkshire, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. It's all mining country around there, isn't it, Woonwell? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Yes. And um, there'd often be a bit of aggro. And somehow we'd find ourselves right in the middle of it. <laughs> middle of it. But, <laughs> but, but talking of aggro, you know, the, the, the interplay between... Son and dad in yeah. karting. It's quite an interesting one. And Johnny's yeah. set, set up was very similar to mine in that his dad was his number one mechanic mm-hmm. to prepare everything. And there'd often be some rucks. Do you, do you remember, jo- Johnny, the one time at Woomwell where you and your dad had a ruck and you threw a spanner at him and he ducked and it went through the side of your car? It did. It did. But the whole the whole got covered with a shell sticker. <laughs> After that. So yes, there that? were quite a few strops, I suppose, when, over when the year. I remember I remember another one actually in Italy when we were at Jessilo and I was really, really miffed with my performance and I remember stamping on the track rod. At the front, no, after, no way. After, and then Dad forced me to to sort of uh, change it. He said, "I ain't changing it. You change it. You broke it. You're doing it." <laughs> so those scraps happened all the way through our career. But to be honest, Jason, we learnt one hell of a lot uh, in that time period, and it was very, very positive mm. for both of us. I think for uh, you know our racing careers as they blossomed in slightly different ways. Uh, well, absolutely, and it sets you up. It sets you up. It, it kind of instills yeah. racecraft mm-hmm. in your right. system where you just do it subconsciously. And I think anyone that comes from karting, they all, t- you know, anyone that's successful like you, like you were, Johnny, 
the, the racing element is just, you've got that covered off. Mm-hmm. So, so after karting, uh, f- you went Formula Ford, what, 85, somewhere around there? Uh, eight, well, actually, my first Formula Ford race was 1983, the Formula Ford Festival. Ah, that okay. was my actual first, uh, first uh, racing experience, which is like the World Cup of Formula Ford. So it was probably yeah, the yeah. most <laughs> stupid thing I did, but it was the most frustrating thing I did as well, mm. Jason, because from karts, it's all nippy and quick and responsive yeah, yeah, yeah. and quite powerful. And a Formula Ford, lazy, slow, <laughs> bloody awful. Yeah. Awful things, yeah. Hated yeah. the things, yeah. It took me a long time before I found I found what I was wanting. And I suppose that actually happened in Formula 3000, actually. And, and what sort of age are you at this point? Obviously, I'm imagining you both being kids with your karting. At what point are you going into proper single-seater cars? Well, uh, 19, I think I was. I think I was okay. 19. So that was, yeah, mm-hmm. so I was sort of quite late <laughs> in modern, yeah. in modern yeah. terms. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that was just the process that uh, that we went through to get to that point of having someone who was mm-hmm. able to back us uh, and back me mm-hmm. to give me that chance of getting into form- Formula Ford. And of course, on that journey, hopefully, hopefully, uh, to, towards Formula One. But as Jason knows, it's all about trying to get that success. And that success is something that is damn hard. You have to work so hard at uh, being able to get yourself in a position to achieve that. Um and once you get that success in those days, just for example, when mm-hmm. I met uh, that uh, that that guy we know here, what's his name, um, mm. Eddie Jordan, um, oh. and he, <laughs> your face. I've got a question for you in a minute. <laughs> yes, do 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 do. That w- I met him uh, at the Grosvenor Awards, which was like the Autosport Awards that we have today, mm-hmm. and basically. We were back to back on, on two separate tables, and he sort of asked me, "Has anybody spoken to me about uh, uh, the 1987 season?" And I said, "No, no one's actually spoken yeah. to me yet." Surprisingly, because yeah. I've done a couple of races successfully in '86. Um, and by the end of that evening, on the back of a napkin, we actually signed uh, signed a deal to do '87. Right? So he was out there to get that talent, and that's yeah. where it's slightly different now. There isn't that ability. You could be the best thing on the planet for you're the be- you're like Senna you're like Alan Prost Ayrton Senna Michael Schumacher mm-hmm. all mingled mm-hmm. into one how much budget you got it's a very <laughs> very different see it is isn't it yeah. it's a very different world that we live in at the moment but I was very successful at each step that I took and that helped me always get the back in you won that first year with EJ and F3 did, did, that's didn't right you? exactly Which was the f- and he hadn't actually won the championship in Formula 3 so it was something he'd been yeah. hunting for for a, for a good few years and then finally he chose the right man Johnny following <laughs> the success with Eddie Jordan then in 1987 comes the crash at Brands Hatch in 1988 that obviously could have been career ending at the very least I guess was a huge turning point in your career you defied the odds to not only rehabilitate yourself and return to racing the following year, but return to racing with your first foray in Formula One. Would you say that that sequence of events over that period of months was perhaps your greatest achievement? Uh, in some ways, when I look back for the, the, the state I was in or the state of my feet, mm. but I was very lucky. It's one of those things, and I think Jason sort of will understand it. I, you know, you've always got this inner belief and want to try and get yourself mm. in the best best car that you possibly could and of course the formula yeah. 3000 accident was before formula one but that mm-hmm. light was still lit and when peter collins took up mm. the option on the contract that i had who was a team manager at the time that gave me a massive lift to be able to work as hard as i possibly could and i have to say yeah. i worked myself quite literally to the bone to get myself mm. ready for that first grand prix that i had in rio was i hundred percent ready? Uh, absolutely not. It probably took me another two and a half mm. years before I was back to as good as I could be. But the circuit Rio de Janeiro was just the perfect track for me, weirdly, because I didn't find it too difficult. Um, it hurt, yes, but the, mm. the whole mm. um, flow of the circuit was just uh, just something that I, it suited me. And I look back now, yeah. and even I go. Wow, how the hell you did that? I really don't know. But I think it was just all that graft to get myself there, mentally being in the right position to try and grab 
this opportunity mm. and I definitely grabbed it. Oh, it's amazing when, just... when you're in the zone, how yeah. powerful, you know, how powerful this is to, to blank everything out. It's amazing, isn't it? What, what you can actually do when you need it to is... do it. Yeah, well, the only thing that was different, Jason, is before I had that accident, I always believed I could beat anybody, anywhere, any car, any condition. And I thoroughly yeah. believe that. Did you have the same thought process? No, yeah, I didn't yeah. think you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, but after the accident, that all disappeared. I never had that sort really? of belief again. Yeah, there was a lot of things that changed because I, I would always go into what? a braking zone, for example, and I would just do it visually. I would take all the 180 mm. degree view that I've got and absorb it mm. through my eyes to my brain. And that would be my breaking point, my turning point, my apex clipping and the, the exit clipping. And then after the accident, I actually had to do points. It was a breaking point. It was then to the really? apex. Then it, Yeah, it changed a lot. It wasn't God, as that's natural. interesting. Yeah, it wasn't as natural as it and was did that, before. And did that remain? And did that remain throughout your career? Or did it I ever had, come back? It came back once, once. And I have wow. no idea why. I wish I knew why, which was Malaysia 99 when I was in the Stewart. And that, it, it weird, very weird. Jason, we've spoken about this before, haven't we? In terms of, um, well, it's, I guess for, for want of a better term, it's a bit like losing your bottle a little bit. You know, it's that, it's that fear. Do you, think that, do you think that the crash sort of made you more aware of your own mortality and therefore it changed the no. way you approach stuff? No, I think before the accident, it was always, it's never going to happen to me. Uh, and then, of course, mm. it happened. But then even after that, I thought, well, it's never going to happen to me again. And I think there are mm. certain characters that can deal with it. It's almost like I say, with all the the dangers that are involved with driving, you can't think about the danger. As soon as you start thinking about the danger, yeah. you'll never be able to get the best out of yourself. You'll be backing off through yeah. quick corners or whatever it may be. So it's almost like you put it in the back of your head in a little tiny box. You lock, the, you lock it and you throw away the key. You cannot yeah. allow the fear factor to come into play. As soon as it does, you're done. See, that's really interesting you say mm. about about how you would visualise a corner and then how you yeah. then change into using little markers. Because yeah. I've always, I've never ever used markers and yet I know very good drivers that do and I could never yes. understand no. how they could actually take their eye off, their mind off what, what you see mm -hmm. to look for something and join the dots up. I could never yeah. get my head around that. No, and no, and no, I, no, no. It, it, I mean, I... I don't drive that way. I drive, you know, I just see and I feel and yeah. I retune. You know, if I break too early, I don't go, all right, there's a tuft of grass. I just retune right. myself to break a bit later. Yes, the next time. So I that's around. really yeah. interesting that you you switch to that. Really yes. intrigued by that. Well, I had to switch. I mean, it bloody worked. By, it, it, it worked. worked. Yeah, it worked. But, it, yeah. but as you know, it's not, it's much easier when you just do it visually so much yeah, easier because yeah. you're not having to think about anything you're actually thinking mm. of your steps ahead you don't you shouldn't yeah. need to or you don't want to try and have those steps because steps are a little bit awkward and not flowing mm. and i found yeah, it yeah, a little bit more that. tougher afterwards but it's, it's interesting that you you do the same thing because you're quite yeah. rare be quite rare there's not many that have this this uh, ability to do that and just very quickly i remember yeah. walking around the circuit with uh, lewis hamilton a good few years ago now and i just mm. sort of asked him as we were walking up towards cops just for example and i said what do you look at when you're going to cops and he went i i don't know i just, I, I, don't, I don't really look at anything and it's exactly that yeah it's exactly Is that, that right but they're quite rare they're quite rare or special you're very special and you are too, mate. I've got a really interesting thing, which is probably very similar, but in different sports. We did some filming a few years ago with Ron, Ron, Ronnie O'Sullivan. And he, he's a, like, a, like a superhero to me. Mm. And actually to, to Tiff as well. And Tiff's, I remember Tiff's, you know what Tiff's like, oh, right, let's analyse it. Let's, let's make a spreadsheet. <laughs> and, he, and he said in the garage one day, as we're wait, waiting for, for the crew to set up a camera, he said, so... Ronnie, you know when you when you're on the on the you know you're about to take a shot. What are you looking at? Are you looking at the cue ball? Are you looking at the pocket? And he just said, "I don't know what you mean." He said, mm. "He said I just I look at I just hit the ball." 
<laughs> and, and I guess it's a similar thing. It's the same. I yeah. guess it's it's a similar thing. Or, or, or maybe golfers. You know how we play golf badly. Yes. But we analyse everything and, and and do it in bits. They just. I guess it's just a natural thing, isn't it? Yeah, I, again, it's like I say, it's a game you say about that on the snooker table. It's probably that 180 degree of taking in mm. everything. It's not just the, the ball, yeah. the cue, the ball, the pockets, the table itself. You actually take in the crowd and the grandstand yeah. that may be there. You, t- yeah. you absorb all that and then you know exactly where you are. And then you have that natural, yeah, yeah. raw, natural ability, you know, to, to do it you know, either in a car, on a snooker table or, or, or even on a, a tennis court. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I think I think both of those examples, both in Lewis and in Ronnie, you know, people that yeah. actually perform in their sports so instinctively. Yes. I would imagine, yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, what do I think about? What do I look about? Actually, I've no idea until I'm actually yeah. there in the moment because it is just that natural ability. Um, Johnny, going back, who were your heroes then growing up when you were you were little? Who were your motorsport idols? Uh, probably the one that always stood out for me was Gilles Villeneuve. Okay, <laughs> and Gilles yeah. because I think he was just completely bonkers and it didn't matter if yeah. he had four wheels on his wagon two or three yeah. he'd still drive <laughs> the flipping wheels off of the thing and he was always yeah. Yeah. so exciting to watch sideways on the circuit he's, you know he had a, such a high risk factor as well very very controlled yeah. as well very sad when he had mm. the accident obviously in, uh, in Zolder but uh, yeah, it was it was you because I, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be mm. someone who could yeah. sort of do anything with that with that car, whatever that car m- may be. Me too, identical. Yeah. What oh, in right. terms of your hero as well? Yeah. Really, uh, and yeah, it was right. was that yeah. I guess was that a sort of character thing then, as you describe, you know, sort of being a bit of a maverick, just being so natural and charismatic, I suppose. He was just there was something really special, quite mm. special about him. Mm. The way you know, yeah. the way the way you could look at his the attitude of his car and he mm. was exciting. You know, he, he seemed to be the only one which yeah. probably is unfair, but he seemed to be the only one in my mind that I wanted to be like. Yeah, it, it, in it fact, is he was really... much better, much better look, look, looking than the pair of us. That's clearly why you're <laughs> as well as. <laughs> well he for Ferrari, and, but, yeah, but, that's but there was something really special yeah. about him. Really, really yeah, but charismatic. Yeah, and even when you look yeah. at videos, that yeah. Dijon race they had with Reni Arnoux, and that lap side by I side, mean, the banging wheels. But it was yeah. that. That was the excitement. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, I didn't do it very well, but I yeah. tried. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm really good mates with Jody she- Schechter and I found it really yeah. awkward to talk to Jody because that was his teammate. And sure. do you know what? When I did, you know, say, look, you know, yes, I thought you were great, Jody, Jody but, uh, you know, my hero was yeah. Gilles. And, and do you know what? He turned around and said, do you know what? I thought he was cool as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think many did in that era, Jason. I think there was just, yeah. you know, there was just such a... I don't know. That's something special about the man. And uh, it's a shame yeah. that we both never met him, but uh, it's still good to see a couple of those videos looking back. So out of all the circuits, I mean, a crazy one to even ask, because I bet there's a few. Yeah. Come on, what what, what circuit, even a karting circuit perhaps, mm. would you, if, if you were given the chance to go back and drive me today in a car, a car or machine of your choice, give us your top three. Well, Suzuka, yeah. I still ah, yeah. thoroughly am in awe with what the drivers do when they go back there even with these modern crazy cars that they've got. The speed those things go around that circuit is pretty mind-blowing. But it's just this old school circuit. The barriers in most places are still quite close uh, to the, to mm-hmm. the curb, which I think is all part and parcel of what it should be all about. So I still love what Suzuka uh, is about. Uh, Le Mans, I have to say Le Mans. I find it... It's not a particular. It's really weird. It's not a particularly difficult circuit to learn, but it's a damn difficult circuit to actually get right. It's a real proper proper challenge. I never did the old Molson. I think that's probably one yeah. one part of it. I wish I, I'd had a go on just to see how scary that was. <laughs> Waiting yeah. for something to happen. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> down that sort of Molson straight. But um, yeah, Le Mans is always something special, and I do I have to say, and I do like it again because it's old school Road America. In the States. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Proper tracks. Love that. Proper track. Just the ch- it was a challenge. It was always about yeah. the challenge. 
and uh, I could go on. You know, Bossport is another one that's really you know fantastic, old school at the same time. And of course, you've got uh, Brands Hatch, which has always been something mm. special. Si- yeah. And Silverstone's been very good because it's changed so much, as we know, Jason, over the years. But I think actually we've got a pretty good challenging track uh, today. So that's more than three. It's funny, you know, Dave, that or, or you know, pr- proper drivers. We all like the barriers to be close, and we don't mm. really want gravel traps. No, and we want it's got to be a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. It's the, mi- it's the mind game, isn't it? It's mm. the mind yes, game it's got to be. It's got to, well. You've got to feel the risk, haven't you? Yes, you have. I suppose what you're saying is that perhaps you know when, as you know, if this is the way that you've learnt your craft in the more, the more old fashioned ways with barriers close there, is that then when you do put a gravel trap and, and a runoff there, does it almost I don't know how to describe it, but it doesn't give you that edge that you perhaps had when you know that there is genuine danger and genuine fear there. Well, it was it was a thrill to me. It was that thrill of mm. knowing that if I got it slightly wrong, I was going to pay a, pay a penalty for doing that. But that was the challenge. The challenge yeah. was to be on that mm. edge. You know, we get all this yeah, yeah. sort of silliness with all track limits that are going on. And a lot of fans actually don't mm. like it because it's ridiculous that a, a driver is losing his lap time. You go, well, no, that's the skill. Austin made me yeah. chuckle because it always used to be, same with, same with you, Jason, all the way through both of our careers. It was always the curb. We actually probably did actually cross the white line. But the curb was actually what we played with as far as the track limits yeah. go. But then in Austin, it was like, well, yeah, it's a bit difficult at turn 19. So we're paint a thicker line. <laughs> and you sort of go, well, what does that achieve? It doesn't achieve anything. Anything. <laughs> anything. I know, I know. And you go, oh, yeah. my Lord, is that where we've got to? The, the challenge is to be between those white lines. And I think the likes of Max and Lewis and Ayrton and Senna and Michael Schumacher, maybe Michael would probably cross it a little bit more, Mika Hakenham, et cetera. That's where they would be so, so special and be able to do okay. it in a qualifying situation, in a race situation. And there are others that are on the circuit even today that can't do it as consistent as the, yeah. as the very unique special ones like Max and Lewis uh, at the present time. Johnny, you raced with Jason as kids in karting. And then as I recall, or as my my research would show me that in 2009 (laughs) you raced together again in the touring car championships i'm not sure that's true i don't think johnny was racing me i believe he was racing himself i believe there was an incident at silverstone where you were it was described it was described to me that you were warmly welcomed welcomed into touring cars by a certain mr jason plato it was a little it was a snog (laughs) It was a little. It was, it was a little it was, car snog. It was a damn aggressive snog. If that's what you call <laughs> snog, my lord almighty! And I tell you what, everybody, he knocked me, spun me round. It was my very first <laughs> race in touring car. I'm still talking, Jason. It was my first race in touring car. He spins me around. He's never said sorry. That's no, Ooh. I did. That's a, that's absolute <laughs> nonsense. Don't give me those blue eyes of yours. Well, do you remember what you said? It wasn't my fault. That's not saying sorry. Yeah, prob- I was looking. I was looking the other way, Your Honour. Yes, I know you were looking the other way. I'm very aware of that, Jason Plato. <laughs> to be honest, I did. I did put my hands up to that. I, I did. It wasn't not, my intent. Not in front of me. Get out of the way. <laughs> it wasn't. I tell you what. I tell you what. With everything that I've done in my career, I bloody hate. Bloody hated those things. <laughs> Front wheel drive did you? Oh, made was- no sense to me whatsoever. I've been spoiled for too long. Yeah, so I was going to say, did you, you know, was it a, a, an, an enjoyable series for you? Obviously no. not. It wasn't your, wasn't your thing. No. Do you, do you know what? They are... I can't elaborate more than that. No. <laughs> they're, they're, no. They're very quirky, <laughs> odd things to get your head around. And once very. you do, what, what, once you plug into it, and, and which jo- Johnny, without a doubt, w- would have been able to do, but it takes a bit of time. He, he would have lo- loved the cut and thrust because it's a bit it's a bit karting esque. Yes, you know, it's it's right on the button. It's it's aggressive. You haven't got long to do anything. No, nope. so pit stops. It's just attack. But they are odd to drive, are they not? They are the front wheel drive ones. I've never done a rear wheel drive, which I would have thought would be a little a little bit more logical for me, but still a challenge all mm-hmm. the same. 
Um, I think it was three races I did. Well, it was three. Was it? Was there two or three races over a race weekend? Two races, but I only did three two events. Races, yeah. If I remember, yeah. So yeah. I only did six, six races. And some else, I think. Yeah, yeah, Rockingham. Yeah, yes. Rockingham. Yes. Yes. That was my best. So yeah. So out of mind. Uh, done. Don't don't bring it up. To me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Parked in the annals of history. Indeed. So look, we. We we remember Schumacher from karting, and and clearly he was yeah. you know on his day he was he was quite exceptional, but yeah. but but he was your teammate. Talk us through that. Tough, <laughs> very 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 tough, but not my problem. Uh, my problem was Flavio Flavio Briatore. Ah, he okay. was the one mm. who made it very very difficult. Michael was was very much thinking about Michael. And totally yeah. understood that when I went there, knew that if the team was wrapped around him, but you were hoping that there would be a little bit of support from Flavio. Because I remember when we had the initial discussions with the contract, it was like, we're a team, we're together, we try and we want to, so the constructors is very important, but we need to be able to work together, which means the data is also going to be sort of you know, free for everybody to have a look at. And then once I get to my second Grand Prix, Michael goes to Flavio. I don't want to... Actually, no, I'll do the whole story. It was uh, Argentina. And as we're walking back on the Thursday practice, we hadn't been there for quite a few years, Michael said to me, he said, Johnny, there's, there's things I do in the car that I don't want you to see. And there's things I'm sure you do in the car you don't want me to see. And <laughs> Is I was that going, right? well, well, yeah, but that's sort of part of it, Michael. I think we've, you know, the data's yeah. there for us to try and learn off of each other. Yes, but there's things that I want to keep sort of secret for myself. So we sort of went back to the hotel, went to bed and everything else. I thought nothing of it. And then got back to the circuit in the morning and, and bless Ross Braun, who was obviously hosting that uh, um, engineers meeting before the kickoff on Friday. And he basically had said that uh, Michael had asked Flavio that uh, he wanted uh, data, his data to be taken away from me so I couldn't view it. And Flavio went, yeah, wait, yes, really? okay. Yeah, but Flavio went, yes, okay. So you go back to that contract negotiation and it's all about a team. Well, suddenly that team yeah, yeah, yeah. has completely disappeared. One person. And of course, mm. the, the interesting thing with that story to the uh, eventually of that weekend and for the rest of the season, he could see mine, but I couldn't see his. <laughs> see, that's, so, a, that's a, <laughs> unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, and it was shown to me, but it was all out the corner of the eye, and you had to be in a special moment that you you couldn't just analyse it. You sort of had to peer at it and sort Good of God. try and quickly with your eyes and try and make out your eyes weren't looking elsewhere. So, and then that's a mental game that then comes into play because mm. you you need the support of everybody, and then suddenly you've got the the team principal who's not backing you up in any in any way, and then you feel alone. Because then you've got no one yeah, to go yeah. to. Because it didn't matter what I asked for, I never got. And that was where mm, the wow. sharing part of it. Would I have beaten Michael? Probably not. Would I have been closer? Yes. But it just became a okay. real big mental game, which eventually I decided qualifying, mm. I've got to forget about qualifying because I'm just not going to be able to compete. Yeah. So focus just on the race, which eventually sort yeah. of paid off, I suppose. But a good man. Good man, Michael. Mm. Yeah, really great, great, great yeah, bloke. Good actually. sense of humour. Great, great, great British yeah, mm. sense of humour. Very mi misunderstood. Yes, very much. So. <laughs> but he never showed it, did he? And that's that. That's no. why. But he didn't want to show it either. Did he ever rip the back of your trousers off you? No, he ripped my shirt. Yes, he did the shirt <laughs> thing, which was always the normal thing he did. Yeah, he ripped every single yeah. button off of my shirt <laughs> in Adelaide. In Adelaide, as it always. He did your trousers, did he? Trousers. Interesting. He did. One. Yeah, he took a whole trouser let leg off. Down, down the back. <laughs> See, cool. no one knew that, did they? I mean, that's a beautiful thing, is that the public no. perception that he was so ice cool and so completely focused, mm. yet inside he had this wonderful sort of cheeky, yeah. naughty sense of humour. I suppose he never really let his guard down because that could be seen as a sign of weakness, maybe? Very, or... very, very much like you, yeah. Johnny, and myself. Yes. <laughs> very guarded. <laughs> very, much, we... so very much so. Very much Yes. Uh, yes. Until, we, until uh, last orders. Yeah. We didn't quite do that. I'll tell you one other story with Michael as well. My, my wife and Karina got on very well in the early days. And we, we did sort of Brazil, Argentina. We came back to Imola. And my wife was sitting down in the hospitality. Uh, Karina came in, said hi. They never spoke for the rest of the year. 
And I think that was my that call. Right? Almost because they're getting on so well, you might they mm. might find out how I click. So don't don't mix don't mix together. Oh, really? And I found that sort of a bit disappointing actually that it fed down to yeah. to the wives and then yeah yeah very very odd. But then you can't take away what he achieved. You cannot take away mm. what he was part of the makeup, isn't it? Part of his. It's part of the makeup. Part yeah, of his absolutely, wiring. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, we see that in some regard with Max. There's a very similar Michael-ish mm. type of mentality yeah. that that is there. Very different than what Lewis yeah. is about. Lewis is a very different, different animal. You know, it's a bit more pure. It's a bit, bit more. You know, I'll I'll make sure. But I know as you remember, he said about Anthony, just beat them on the circuit, and that's that's mm. what he tries yes. to do. Yeah. So here we go. Let me rewind your memory back to a pretty dull day, I think. I think it was Silverstone in 95. Do you, do you remember much about that? Vague recollection, yeah. It was a bit damp, oh, it was bit a British damp in the Prix. morning. Yes. Was it yes. British Grand Prix, I think? Was it? Uh, I think it was. I think, I believe it was. There was a lot of people there. Yes, there was a lot of people there. So, yeah, it was quite, quite and did difficult right? getting in the circle. Yes, I think it was the British Grand Prix. You're right. Yeah. Good day. And how did you get on? Uh, I, think I did all right. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was a bit average. Yeah, to be honest. Uh, yeah, t- I took my time. Uh, yeah, I knew it was going to be a long race. Um, Come on, what's and, it like winning the British Grand Prix? What is it uh, like? Uh, it's pretty, pretty bloody awesome to be honest. Because <laughs> uh, it's seeing that sea of fans, especially on the last lap. I remember seeing that sea of fans standing up waving in the grandstands on the top of those banks the whole way around the circuit and of course they're waving those flags for you but I do also remember when I was a little bit further back when I was at Lotus they used to do the same they've got they were and still are great support for for all the British drivers but yeah seeing that last lap it well it made my you know the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because it's something that you had been working for for mm. so so long and then for it to happen in a formula one race is special but to actually actually have it at your home grand prix and it's silverstone as well with all the racing that you've done from formula four all the way through okay. it makes it pretty pretty uh um, amazing but it was two two memories for me because there was all that getting myself into that position and then secondly, it was worth all that pain I went through after the accident to actually yeah. keep on mm. pushing myself as well. So actually the first thought was about the accident and sort of patting myself wow. on the shoulder and going, Really? Yeah, that That's was, interesting. Yeah, that was the first thing. And then actually it was mm. the, the enjoyment of actually winning the race itself second, strangely enough. But uh, just, just special, Jason, because it's just one of yeah. those wonderful sporting venues that still today is massively special for not just the British drivers, but actually all the drivers that go there, which is which is nice to hear. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it? Kind of, you know, going back to what we were saying before, I wonder whether without the accident, whether you would have been the same person because it did make you have to fight a lot harder, didn't it? You know, I'm not saying that you wouldn't have got there without that, but it certainly, you know, you were up against it, weren't you? You know, you were against adversity and... Who knows how your success would have panned out had that not been the case at Brands Hatch in, in 88? Yeah, well, at the end, I find it quite interesting because as a character before before mm. the accident, going even back to karting, you know, I was quite shy. I was never really mm. said boo to a goose. And I was, I never really overly mingled with, uh, other team principles let's let's say with from other yeah. teams so again the shyness i wasn't very sort of i'm here i'm johnny you should mm. give me a drive i wasn't like that mm. at all mm. and then my character which is probably still there today changed is where you've got that happy chappy laughy johnny and that was because the only way i could get through those very very early days of because i went to Fel- a place called felkirk in austria <laughs> And that's where Tony Mattis, who uh, did a, a few drives, Keke Rosberg, Nigel Mansell, for example, looked after them in his clinic. And I would literally go into the forest and then climb a mountain to the top, come back down again, climb the mountain once again and do that sort of four or five times every single day. And my, 
my toes they still don't bend now my toes didn't bend so it was so right painful i mean so painful mm. and then once a month i used to wake up and go i just i can't do this this is just this is just too much my mind is just ready to explode because of the the pain that i was going through and then i'd go i'd sleep the following night and i'd wake up in the morning all fresh and, and do it all over again so reset but reset but the only way i could get over it even at that period but then when actually when i started racing was to laugh about it and that was the way yeah. i could get over the pain that i was in every single race and even to the very last race that i did especially my my right foot which my toe got dislocated and severed off slightly and they stitched it back on again and there's a bit of callus that grows underneath the toe mm. and it was so sensitive painful but i couldn't tell anybody yeah. because if i told someone yeah. this was through my whole career if i we, told someone i would mm. never have got a drive so i had to yeah, keep that to just, myself i never even told my wife mm. because i didn't want her yeah. to worry about it as well so that goes back to a little bit about the view that we had when we were driving mm, yeah, so yeah. there's that view mm. then there is that's all you're thinking about you're not thinking about anything else mm. but i'm thinking that with about 20 laps to go i'm going to start to get this painful situation again so i'm even thinking about right how do i get around that because at silverstone when i won in 95 was trying to work out how do i get to the end of the race because i was and i'm not lying when i say this i for the last 16 15 16 laps there were points when i was breaking that i was actually screaming in the car because I know I was shouting, wow. shouting, scream because it was so, so painful. But then I thought, right, how do I, mm. how do I ease that pain? So my, my left ankle doesn't actually flex very much. So left foot breaking was sort of quite new in those days. And I thought, well, mm -hmm. the only way I can do it, if I can left foot break for one lap, I can then go to right foot breaking for two laps, then one lap, then two. Yeah. I alternated for the end of the yeah. race. So again, you've, yeah. that's another extra load of pressure on your shoulder. That yeah, the other guys yeah. haven't got i haven't got to deal yeah. with any of that plus yeah. then i'm when i get out of the car i can't tell anybody about it it's only i can talk about <laughs> yeah. it now yeah. so there's so much so much different elements that i was having to to deal to deal with i'll give myself a pat on the shoulder for doing for saying all this right. but it was true i had to, i had to find different ways of getting around yeah. the problems that that i had and I would imagine that during that lap at Silverstone in 1995, when you've just yeah. won, um, relatively speaking, it's quite a short period of time. However, within that process, you're effectively summing up in your own head your entire career, are you not? I mean, yeah. I, I, that's not to say that your career didn't go on to success, because of course it did. But at that moment, I, was, I would imagine you've achieved that one dream that you've been striving towards from the age dot. And then as you're going around, you're thinking, I've had the accident, I've come back, I've done what I wanted to do, I've won the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, and you're putting it all into context. Yeah but there's one thing missing from it, which is the dream that we had when we were karting. It was to do what, Jason? Yes, it was to drive a Formula One car, absolutely. It was to be a world champion. That was, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, that was the whole point. It wasn't yeah. just being on the grid or being there on a Sunday. It was the world championship. So I didn't achieve that. So I frustrated the way that the career went that I never had that chance in a proper way mm. to try and get that world championship would it have been different i think it would have been but again you know you you don't know because the circumstances can could come into play where drivers should be world champion they never achieve it you know fernando alonso should be more than two-time world champion for example but it doesn't mm. always uh, work out that yeah, way yeah, uh, nigel does, mansell yeah. should be more than one time world champion but but he is still a Formula One world champion as well. So the ultimate goal was always the world championship. You know, looking back, I'm very proud that I got three Grand Prix wins. Yeah. And I'm so happy that I got that Le Mans win as well with the, with the Mazda. Yeah, yeah, the Mazda. Mm. Um, and then there's been various other formulas that I've done that I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, except the British Touring Car.
<laughs> well, you know what? Funny enough, Johnny, I was going to say, I was going to say this. Ordinarily, we ask all of our guests about their first car and their car history and passing a <laughs> test and all this. And quite frank, quite frankly, I don't care. And and that's a compliment in so much as this has been such a wonderful insight into an amazing career and and the mindset and and everything. It's been it's been beautiful. Um, so what I'm going to do instead, Jason, if it's okay with you, rather than going down those normal questions, I want to yes. end here. But I want to end with one thing and one thing only and I would like a formal apology from you Jason Plato for what you did to our guest Johnny Herbert in 2009 at Silverstone in the touring cars I want for the first time ever a formal apology and then for the we first time let- ever because yeah, I'm still scarred. I'm still scarred. <laughs> and then we'll see it just there look yeah. then we will let this gentleman go Johnny I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eyeball you straight down the lens my good friend jo- Johnny, I simply run out of talent that afternoon and take all blame. I am yes. very, oh, good. very sorry for that for that love kiss at Silverstone. Okay, I think was that was that it, Dave? So, was that was that enough? That'll do. That'll do. do, that'll do that'll okay, <laughs> apology accepted. So listen, with that apology formally accepted, it's a beautiful moment in history. And on that note, Jason, I think you need to take us out. Oh, mate, we could sit here and talk all day, could, couldn't, couldn't we? we not? But, yes, but unfortunately, ace. we can't, we can't. So that is it for this week's Fueling Around, powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, as always, a big thanks to you. But a huge thanks to our special guest, my old mate, the one and only, Johnny Herbert. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dave. I've had fun, I have to say. It's been great. It's been a pleasure, Johnny. Thank you very much. Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plater, at David Vitti. And if you've liked what you've heard, feel free to give us a five star rating, press the follow button, and share the podcast on all your socials. Uh, thanks, folks, for listening, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Ta da!